It's all yours, Don. Hey, everyone. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for tuning in today. I'm Don Haina, a member of the CFA Society of San Francisco and part of our Member Programming Advisory Council. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our event, Is Stock Market Weather Good in the Summer? Our speaker today is Ken Fryer, Chief Investment Officer at Atlas Capital Advisors. And a quick item to note before we start, you will be muted for the event, so we encourage you to type questions in the Q&A box. We'll monitor the questions closely and endeavor to have as many answered as possible. This event will be recorded and we will share the replay on YouTube. Now I'd like to introduce Ken Fryer. Ken has over 30 years of experience as an institutional investor, having the chief investment officer of the Walt Disney Company, Hewlett Packard Company, Stanford Management Company, and the UAW Retiree Medical Benefits Trust. He is currently the CIO of Atlas Capital Advisors, a San Francisco-based registered advisory firm, and a member of the Investment Advisory Group of the Alaska Permanent Fund. His career includes extensive research, writing, and speaking on asset allocation and investment risk management. Ken graduated with honors in math from the University of North Carolina and has an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's a CFA charter holder and an active member and volunteer with the CFA Society of San Francisco. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ken, and I'll start our presentation. All right, uh, thanks very much, Don, for the introduction. And by the way, it's not just uh, me who's going to be talking. Uh, Don and I are um, delivering this presentation together. Um, so it's May, it's May 2023. And so it's, um, Don, if you could move one slide ahead, um, it's time to, revisit the familiar ad adage, sell in May and go away. Um, should investors sell in May in general and should investors sell in May uh, 2023 in particular? Um, what we're going to show you is that in actual fact, this old saying would have been a good investment strategy. On average, over the last 50 years, it would have been advantageous to be in bonds instead of stocks during the summer and in stocks just in the winter. But we're also going to show you that even though we can demonstrate a great backtest for this strategy, you need more data than even 50 years of data to conclude that we have a statistically significant phenomenon. We'll talk about theories about why this might have worked and our leading theory about why this sell in May strategy worked in the last 50 years. Um, but we'll also show you that the, this, the statistical significance is not that strong. It actually would not have worked in U.S. history before the 1970s. There are other seasonal effects in equity investing that seem to have a stronger basis that we'll share with you. And then we'll conclude the presentation by talking about May 2023 in particular and why this might be a more promising than usual year to lighten up on stock market risk. So the origin of the saying sell in May and go away goes back about 250 years. Uh, the full expression was sell in May and go away, come back on St. Ledger's Day. That's the date of a British classic horse race for three-year-olds. It, it's always the last classic, and it, it, it happens at the end of summer in September or October. And back when this saying originated, the investing elite of Britain would literally go away. They would get out of you know crowded, hot, stinking London and go to their country homes. And it would be doubly relaxing to be out in the country and it wouldn't be in the stock market. 
The empirical research on this effect also calls it the Halloween indicator because of the, the re-entry date uh, there's a tendency of the stock market performance to get better after Halloween. If we look at the data from 1969 to the present, uh, we can see that there's a clear seasonal pattern. This chart shows the average monthly returns um, for, uh, for stocks relative to bonds for the S&P 500, that's the blue columns, and for the MSCI World XUS, um, that's the international stocks you know, shown in gray here. The uh, months in the middle of the year that are within the dashed red circle are, are the you know, months where uh, you would be out of the market if you pursued the sell in May strategy. And as you can see, for every one of those months, June through October, on average, the blue line, the blue bar is negative. So it would have been better to be in. U.S. 10-year treasuries instead of stocks. And for non-U.S. stocks, uh, you would have done better in stocks than bonds in July. But on average, you would have done a lot worse um, uh, in that whole period, June through October. So there's, th there's a clear pattern here. And in fact, yeah, go ahead to the next slide. If we look at the back test of a strategy of selling in May, it's actually really good. In this chart, the gray line is the real return of investing in 10-year treasury notes, US notes. The blue line is the real return of investing in the S&P 500. The green line is the return of investing in the S&P 500, except for from June through October, where you're in 10-year treasuries. It's a much better return series, 2% per year higher return, it's also less risky, 2% uh, per year less risk. All of us in, as investors are seeking the ideal return versus risk relationships. So it looks like sell in May would have been a good way to achieve that. The next slide shows the same thing with international stocks. Uh, in this chart, the blue line are uh, MSCI World X US, and the green line is uh, a sell in May strategy. There, the return advantage is even larger. It would have been 4% per year almost uh, uh, better to do the sell in May strategy than to own non-US stocks the whole time. And there's a similar risk reduction. So it looks like and, this is really a good idea. Ken, this really seems to violate the norm that if something is known and in the market that the, everyone would participate in it. I, I'm sure you have a response. Yeah, this is really an, uh, what's referred to as an anomaly, like something that one can observe from the um, historical data that doesn't seem to have a very good reason. And it, it violates two of the cardinal rules that investors are you know, constantly hearing um, as they learn about investing. One of the cardinal rules is that if you're going to invest in the stock market, you shouldn't try to time it. You should just always be in the market because you never know when the good returns are going to come. Um, but in fact, if sell in May works, then being out of the stock market from June through October would have been better. So it violates the always be invested rule. It also violates the stock market efficiency. What we learn, you know, all of us that have C CFA credentials, we learn that the market is efficient, market prices reflect all known information, and therefore any strategy that depends upon information that everybody knows is unlikely to be very advantageous. But in fact, over the last 50, 50 years, information that even people who aren't investment investors know it's become May again, would have been the basis of a really quite advantageous strategy. So it's really quite an anomaly. And so we have to think about, well, why is this happening? And is this going to be a reliable um, way for us to invest in the years going forward? Now, some of the theories in the empirical literature about sell in May um, say, well, one of the reasons that this might happen is there's just more spending by consumers in the months from, say, November through May than in the summer in part because of, you know, there's more holidays where people get together, there's a lot of gift giving, um, people get 
bonuses uh, sometimes at year end, then there's more savings and profitability might be higher. And that could be a reason for better stock performance uh, during the winter months. Another thing one can observe is that investors tend to take less risk and there tends to be just less trading volume in the summer. Another reason perhaps that stock market returns lag. And the third possible theory is that there's definite evidence that risk appetite surges in January and then it recedes during the year. So since January is in that sort of non-summer period, uh, then that risk taking that begins the year uh, could be another reason why we have better performance for stocks in the kind of non-summer months. But it, as you hear these reasons, you're probably not going to be that satisfied. Like these don't sound like they're that strong as reasons. And so we'll, going to the next page, this is what I think is the real reason. It's more, <clears throat> pardon me, it's really more a coincidence of when recessions happened in the period since 1969. In this chart, the recessions are shown in with the blue shading. The, uh, the line on the chart is the real return of the S&P 500. There's some colored segments on the line. The green colored segments are bad summers that are part of the track record. Um, the six best, uh, worst summers are, are um, all on the chart. And we can see that all of these bad summers happened when the US had a recession, around the time of a US recession. So as it happened in this period, uh, recessions tended to kick in around the beginning of the year, around when summer was going to start. And so the main impact on the stock market uh, from the recession uh, captured those summer months. The green segments are uh, when there were strong winters. So that's another part of the sort of summer versus winter observation. And we can see that some of the, the good winters were recession recoveries. Uh, you can observe that in 1974, a strong um, winter as we came out of a recession. The over way on the right of the chart, that period from like, November of 2020 into 2021 was a very strong period um, outside of summer for the stock market. So it's these sort of isolated observations of very um, bad summers and strong winters that account for the you know, strong back test for the strategy that I shared with you earlier. The interesting thing about it is that, that if we look at the last 50 years from today's date, uh, going back from today, um, on average, it would have been a successful strategy. But if we did the same test back in 1969 and tried to determine historically would it have been good to sell in May or not, it actually would have been, uh, the evidence would have been strongly in the opposite direction. It would have been very disadvantageous to be out of the stock market in summer. Uh, and, and so the interesting thing about uh, what we can observe here is that even 50 years of data indicating that Selma could have been a good idea, um, it, it collapses when you look out of sample at the 70 years that went before it. And it shows just how much data is really required for us to draw a conclusion about whether an observation about um, investment behavior is reliable. Uh, for all of you listening, I, I just urge you to be quite um, skeptical whenever uh, you see a test uh, based on historical information, uh, because as uh, my friend Don is about to show you that, that as strong as the results were for sell in May, it's not that statistically significant. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Yeah, so I, I was very uh, skeptical and I wanted to dig a little deeper. And so throwing some statistics at the monthly returns of sell in May versus just buy and hold, uh, it's there's a the p-value is 0.46, which means there's basically a 46% chance you would see this uh, anomalous behavior due, due to chance. So uh, what, what this shows is there's not a significant, uh, we, we don't have significant confidence in this approach. 
However, just for contrast, the, uh, the performance difference between the sell in May strategy and holding just bonds uh, is quite strong. So we have a, a very low p-value, which says the probability of that occurring due to chance was just 0.4%. And going forward, uh, I broke the data down. So Ken had this data and, and we looked at it a couple of ways. The short version here is what's going on is the, the sell in May strategy is avoiding these longer tail losses uh, that you see uh, among the strategies. And this is the summer winter yearly performance. So in blue, we have the winter performance and in red, we have the summer. And what you can see here over the period from 1970 to 2023 is these, these, bad, these bad return years. Uh, and this is exactly what Ken's chart showed, but this is just a, a different way of looking at. It. So these are the outliers at the bottom uh, are really what's dragging down your returns. And again, I was a little skeptical. So I, I thought, well, what what would the returns be if you looked by decade? So you, again, this is a little suspect because we're only looking at 10 data points here, but it, it gives you an interesting perspective. You can see that um, in general, you know, here uh, between the 70s and 80s, there's almost no statistical significant difference. And you can also note that the outliers are about the same. But over the long term, uh, we caught a few more recessions in the summer that sell in May avoided. And so you see here, the 1990s to 2000, uh, a big difference in performance. That's probably accounts for a large portion. And 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 again, in sort of 20, uh, sorry, 2000 to 2010. And then ironically, in the last three years here, you've seen that uh, sell in May uh, ha has done much better due to some of the timing of, of recessionary and, and other environments. But again, if you look at the the outliers below the red box, you see that Time and again, there are these three or four big years of negative returns. And that's what seems to be driving the value uh, or the difference in this. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Ken, to talk about other seasonal effects. So in equity factors, there are some really strong uh, seasonal effects that one can observe in the data, but they also seem to be more reliable to me because there's a behavioral explanation uh, that makes sense. This is a powerful effect related to volatility of stocks. What, you're sh what this shows is um, by month, the result of having a long short portfolio where you own stocks that have high volatility or high beta and your short stocks that have low volatility or low beta. In the month of January, when all the traders have fresh ri risk budgets, the high volatility stocks do much, much better than the low volatility stocks. And then every other month is the opposite. It's just better to be in lower volatility stocks. So this has been a powerful effect that uh, investors that look at equity factors uh, should bear in mind. On the next page, there's seasonal effects in the outcomes of value, the value factor. Here I'm looking at two value indicators earnings to price with the blue bars and cash flow to price with the gray bars. This is the outcome of a portfolio of, of owning the stocks with high earnings to price and being short the ones with low earnings to price or cash flow to price. You can see in the data a value preference for early in the year, particularly in January, and for the end of the year in December as um, investment managers clean up their portfolio so it looks good when the year-end reports go out. The final seasonal factor to mention is momentum. Now, momentum is, as a factor is exactly the opposite of volatility. This is the result by month of owning stocks that have higher, high prior returns, that they, they did well in the last year, and short the stocks that have poor prior returns. In January, that's a bad strategy the stocks that were beaten up in the prior year do really well in January. Uh, and in fact, if you think about this year, this year was a fantastic year for the beaten down stocks. Some of the tech names in particular that had a bad 2022 had a fantastic January. Mom uh, momentum is a great factor every other month, but beware of trying to use momentum in January uh, because of this effect. So we're not, we're trying not to persuade you that sell in May is a great idea, but some of these uh, factor observations um, are interesting. 
on to the next All slide. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> Ken, I'll let you, if you want to go through it, otherwise I can. Uh, we can take a stab at this. Do, should investors sell in May this year? Um, I'll, maybe I'll do the first part of this and, and you can jump in. Sure. What's happening now is really, it's really a classical kind of cycle. Um, if, if one, I'm kind of a market historian, and I, I've read a lot and studied a lot of the economic history. When there are long stretches where nothing bad happens to investors, investors become relaxed about taking risk and they take more risk and eventually they take too much. And that's followed by volatility and losses. So we clearly saw that in 2021, and now we're in the aftermath. Another thing one can observe is that if there's long periods where interest rates are really low, that also pushes people out on risk. And the same thing happens, eventually too much risk and instability. The third thing that's happening is that large and rapid tightening of monetary conditions that almost always causes a recession. And we've had that as well. So we can think about what's happening now in the context of repeated episodes of the same kind of thing in financial market history. Do you want to jump in, Don, about the? Sure. Yeah. And, and the next slide, we'll talk about the tale of two summers as well. So you know, one of the big concerns we have with the, not only the recession, but the, the large increase we've had in rates is the fragility of commercial banks. And uh, that's clearly going to cause tighter financial conditions in terms of lending, these local banks do a lot of local projects. And so their, their puckering in terms of lending will have an effect on the economy uh, through, throughout the country. And so what we see uh, key points is deposit outflows as customers are looking for higher yields and safety elsewhere, significant unrealized losses on long-term fixed rate assets. And some of these are technically hiding in their held to maturity uh, balance sheet categories rather than being marked to market as would apply for available for sale uh, assets on the balance sheet. Uh, and that affects entities as large as uh, you know, some of the investment firms as well. And the impairment of value uh, for the commercial real estate uh, collateral that's used for mortgage loans. So we've seen a big drop in commercial real estate values and uh, there's a risk that empty buildings and other things will cause foreclosures. Escalating risk of default uh, by loan customers facing these higher borrowing costs. These are people who may have started a project with the intention of refinancing at a certain rate. By the time the project's finished, they're facing much higher rates and, and it may not pencil anymore. Um, and the other issue we have is that equities are not cheap. And we'll talk about that. The prices don't seem to reflect the possibility of recession. So with, with that in mind, we want to look at what's going to happen, what could happen this summer. And so we have a tale of two summers here, the best of times and the worst of times. And there's a lot here. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of touch lightly on these. And then we have some data to, to fill in the gaps here. But the, when we look at what could happen in the best scenario, the best case scenario, we would have inflation metrics drop. Uh, the Fed would pause and would voice this clearly. And the highlighted terms are things that we think that make sense to monitor, to try to figure out which of these is evolving over time. Uh, the interest rates are, would be steady or fall. Uh, Jeffrey Guntlodge says the Fed always follows the two-year rate. We'll look at that a little more closely and see if that's happening. And the Fed policy would align to the current market sentiment that says rates will be, be dropping. Right now, the Fed's not saying that. If this happens, we hope investors would hear the all clear message, get back into the market. Anticipated falling rates would push the multiples back up and the earnings would continue uh, buoyed by nominal reporting, which actually inflation gives a little bit of a tailwind to, to people's earnings reports. Um, we also think the dollar would fall if interest rates fall. That would spur growth for international companies and potentially bonds and stocks could both rally or at least bonds and we'd have the yield curves steepening as the business cycle clocks forward. So that's the best case. Now, the worst case, which is not good, but we'll, we'll throw it all in. Um, and that is that inflation sticks around for a, a long time and the Fed hikes maybe two more times. Uh, the market sentiment in this case would realign to what the Fed's been saying. Uh, more regional banks could falter and that could cause some contagion or spread, uh, uh, spreading contagion that might all but freeze up the credit markets. Housing starts, commercial real estate values, and home purchases could all drop. Consumers who are working through their savings now would increase their credit card debt and slow in spending. That spending would translate to lower earnings. And levered companies with debt that's maturing could face existential problems. 
while cash rich business models may continue and may actually thrive. And I think the high yield spread there is something that might give some, some data on that, which of these scenarios is evolving. So what we're gonna do now is take a closer look at the factors affecting the equity performance this year, particularly over the summer, the things to watch. So interest rates, Fed policy in the market's views, data indicators, and some discussion of multiples connected to interest rates and earnings. And the first slide, I think I'll turn this over to Ken as the market historian, uh, talks about the, basically the interaction of the Fed policy and, and yields. So Ken, would you like to weigh in here? The most important takeaway from this slide is that monetary tightening almost always causes recessions. This chart shows a lot of different interest rates. Uh, the one that we're gonna focus on here are the shorter term ones. You see the kind of blue and aqua or blue and green lines there. Um, it's easy to see the periods where the Fed raised interest rates a lot. And it's also easy to see that often when interest rates went up a lot, then we had a recession. The recessions are illustrated in the shaded um, areas on the chart. Um, so over and over again, pretty much almost every time that the Fed has had a tightening cycle, uh, there was a recession. And the only exceptions are in the mid 80s, uh, you can see there's some uh, increase in rates uh, without a recession in the mid 90s. In the mid 80s, in the mid 90s, the economy was a lot stronger than it is now. Uh, and so we didn't have a recession. One of the notions that um, one of the notions that is I often see in commentary about the stock market is, oh, is, is once the Fed stops raising rates, that's going to be fantastic for stocks. And so that's a reason to buy now. But actually, the opposite tends to be true. Once the Fed stops raising rates, they stop because they're worried about economic growth. They stop because there's probably going to be a recession. It actually is not necessarily a good, in fact, on average, not a good idea to just buy stocks because the Fed finally is done tightening. And on this next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, annotate basically the last, this is the last year or so. Um, what's, going, what's been going on with rates? Because it's very curious. If we look at the start here, the Fed was slow to raise while the market and the two-year in particular started to take off. And you see this staircase of, of rate increases uh, following basically the two-year in red here and, and the, and the three-month yield. And then an interesting thing happened. Uh, around the time in early March when Silicon Valley Bank failed and, and there was a takeover, you saw the market had a, the bond market had a big reaction. And I think the, uh, I'll, I'll let Ken weigh in a little more on this, but the, the feeling was bond investors said, hey, we, we think this is bad news and the Fed should lower and, and things are looking worse. And yet the Fed, the question marks here, the Fed uh, continued and it hiked twice since then. And so the gap now between what the market, the bond market in particular, is forecasting for the economy and what the Fed is doing is, is getting wide. It's, it's one of the largest we've seen. And it's, it's upside down compared to before where they were late. And so one of the questions here, and I think this is the important one, is what's the resolution of the disagreement between the Fed and the, uh, and, and the market disagreement? And I'll... Uh, I'll turn it over here, and uh, I think Ken can, can annotate this. So if you look at what, what's going on, the market is pricing a soft landing with potential cuts, and uh, actually several cuts before the, before the year end or the meeting in January. And the Fed is saying it's going to maintain the rate. And so you've got these two scenarios where uh, investors are thinking, if it weren't for smooth sailing here, and the Fed is saying, no, it's a rough ride. We've got to drive, got to drive inflation down, and uh, we've got the controls here. And uh, Ken, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for, to talk a bit about the fixed income investor view. Well, it, there's really a disconnect between the outlook of fixed income investors and the outlook of equity investors. On March 8th, we had the first news from Silicon Valley Bank that they were losing money quickly, losing deposits quickly, and needed to raise money. And then they failed on March 10th. If we just look at what's happened since March 8th, 
as Don just mentioned, interest rates have gone down, at least expectations of the rates as set by the Fed have gone down a lot. Fixed income investors are worried that we're getting toward a recession and the Fed is going to pivot and start cutting rates. At the same time, since March 8th to present, the S&P 500 is up almost 10%. So does that make sense? If, if the outlook is that, well, we're probably gonna have a recession and the Fed is gonna to have to pivot, that actually shouldn't be good news for equity investors. And yet we're seeing a rally in the stock market. Right, and I'll, I'll jump in here. And so this is the basically the, the markets, if you look at the probabilities based on the pricing of futures contracts for interest rates, uh, this is the Fed, Fed Watch tool. And it's showing that this is for the January 24th meeting up here. There's a, the market has priced in basically a, a, a 96% probability that the rates will go down lower. So we are currently uh, right here between 500 and 525 basis points. And these are the bets that are being placed with dollars in the market on based on futures. And so uh, the bet is that this will go lower. Now, this, this may be one reason that the, the market is sort of rallying, but it begs the question, why is the market not paying attention to what the Fed is saying? And I think uh, in, in further support of this, what is the Fed, when is the Fed going to change its, its stance? And uh, this is a, an interesting group of uh, checklists from Lisa Goodwin uh, talking about what it is the Fed needs to sort of be satisfied that it's time to cut rates and we're, we're winning against inflation. And so you can see here, core inflation at two, two and a half percent for three months moving lower. We're not there yet. Wage pressure moving lower, unemployment rate of 4% or higher, and finally, well-anchored short-term and long-term inflation expectations. And I think the, the these are complicated issues, but I'll touch on them lightly. There are a lot of things driving uh, in the inflation entrenchment. And uh, so, so figuring out what's sticky is very tricky here. And one example was the auto manufacturers who, in the in the face of supply chain shortages, decided to make fewer, more expensive and more profitable cars. And they seem to be sticking to that, which is keeping inflation up. And the questions of wages and unemployment, there's a lot of changes in the workforce, the way people work from home, who's eligible and counted in the workforce is also changing. And a bigger issue geopolitically, we've had this deep globalization move, which is very inflationary with large CapEx required to move production either domestically or to other countries. And if you think about it, companies in the face of higher rates and lending costs are probably very reluctant to take on these uh, commitments. You know, and a core question to ask was, would you commit capital now at these rates to, uh, to build domestically when you're not sure what's gonna happen politically in the next three to five years on a 10 year project? And lastly, on top of all that, we have this tighter credit in the regional banks, I mean, there's a, in a sense, less competition for newly formed businesses, newly formed office spaces and housing and things like that, which gives pricing power to the incumbents. So it really the point of this slide is to show that it could be a while before the Fed is satisfied, even though the market is voting otherwise. And uh, a last comment here just on the timing of the Fed's sea change, if you will, is that if you look at the typical uh, indicators and processes evolving in a recession and where the Fed might react, you can see that we're probably in the you know, third getting into the third quarter here, but we've we've seen housing and liquidity sensitive areas fall down. We've seen commercial real estate drop, some manufacturing, service sector we think is next, and then the labor market kind of the last to fall. And this appears to be what the Fed is focusing on. So a key question, and one of the the key differentiators, or I guess, difference in the, of opinion is when the Fed will make will pivot and make make a, a change to policy. And that's where we see the difference between the equity investors and, um, and, and the Fed. And Ken, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for some insights into why we, uh, investors might be wise to, um, to, to heed the Fed or take a look at what history has shown. Sure, I'm gonna go through uh, a set of slides quickly and then we can turn to the questions. This is an index that's produced by the uh, New York Fed. Uh, they're evaluating the probability of a recession in the next 12 months solely using the yield curve. Many of you might be familiar with the observation that when we have a 
an inverted yield curve with short rates higher than longer rates, then it has been a reliable recession indicator. And the yield curve got so inverted, has gotten so inverted this year that uh, according to this model from the New York Fed, the odds of having a recession in the next year are almost 70%, the highest odds that we've had since the sort of 1979, which led to two kind of back-to-back -back recessions. Let's go to the next. Um, I maintain a composites of the world's economic data. And quickly, uh, this is a kind of a Z-score, a standard deviation, good or bad for consumer confidence. You can see that when consumer confidence is negative, that we tend to have a recession and the confidence has fallen to a recession level um, negativity without yet having the recession. Other indicators that also are at recession levels are, next one. So industrial indicators like the PMIs are all in negative territory. So that we've gotten to recession levels um, on that set of data. The leading indicators are very negative. Uh, you can see we're at like minus one standard deviation. Every time leading indicators have become as negative as this, then the US had a recession. Real estate indicators, this is things like building permits, housing starts, housing prices. Those are also quite negative. Every time real estate indicators have been as negative as this, the US had a recession. Um, and one data point related to real estate is the collapse in the value of office buildings. This is the price of the MSCI office REIT index. Uh, you can see that it was pretty steady over a thousand uh, from uh, you know, 2014 until last year. And now it's like below 500. So office buildings, at least the office buildings represented in this index, they've lost half their value in a short period of time. And these office buildings are collateral for real estate loans held by regional banks. And so it's just, it's a kind of scary indicator of the pressures faced by regional banks. And those pressures are showing up in the stock prices. Go ahead. Yeah, you can go to this. This is the uh, Keith Gruet and Woods regional stock price, uh, regional bank index. And that has lost about a third of its value uh, just since the Silicon Valley bank crisis. So banks are under pressure. And when banks are under pressure, they make it harder to for people to get loans. Um, this chart <clears throat> shows the percent of banks that are tightening lending standards versus loosening uh, lending standards in three different categories of lending. The blue line is commercial industrial loans to large and mid-sized business. The green line is credit cards and the red line is um, as small firms, loans to small firms. Every time that credit uh, conditions have become this tight, there was a recession. And moreover, this data only is uh, available through April. And so the, excuse me, the um, uh, follow-on impacts from the uh, failure of Silicon Valley Bank and others uh, probably would cause this to become even tighter uh, in this month and the months ahead. Now, the what you often hear is, oh, we shouldn't worry about the economy because the unemployment rate is really good. I mean, it's it's I think the lowest it's been lowest has been in decades. This is a composite of unemployment rates around the world. What isn't well understood is that when employment peaks and then turns, it's a terrific recession indicator. If you look at this chart, in each instance where employment was very strong, but then the trend changed, then the recession followed shortly after. So rather than think about employment being fantastic as being a sign that we won't have a recession, if we see some erosion of employment, now, I mean, we've got good data today, so maybe it's not erosing yet, but if we see it eroding from a strong level, that actually has been 
a quite powerful indicator that a recession is around the corner. And this is what everybody cares about, Ken, which is what's, gonna, what's that going to do to the market? So yeah, I'm, I'm, this is a slide I'm the most interested in. So if you look at, at data, actually, if you look even looking back even further, uh, typically when the U.S. has a recession, the earnings growth, earnings for the S&P 500 fall about 20%. That's not what is being uh, anticipated now. Currently, um, sell-side equity research analysts expect earnings this year will be about the same as last year, so not down year over year. And they expect next year's earnings will be 10% higher than this year's earnings. So if, if we have a recession, those expectations are too high. Moreover, we're depending on maintaining a relatively high level of price to earnings ratio for the S&P 500, particularly in relation to what's happened to the 10-year treasury yield. In this line, in this chart, the um, blue line is the forward earnings yield of the S&P 500. So the anticipated earnings divided by the current price. The green line is the 10-year treasury yield. And then the purple line is the difference. It's basically the premium of the stock market yield over the bond market yield. We can observe that the purple line has been falling in, and in fact has fallen a lot in the last three years. It's reached the lowest level of premium that has been observed since 2007, um, since before the global financial crisis, when it, by the way, the stock market lost half its value. So <clears throat> usually what happens in a recession is that stocks um, have a rise in their risk premium. The, the gap, the purple line here would go up. That is the, the gap between the yields on stocks and bonds would rise. And you can see spikes in the purple line in the COVID recession in 2020, in the global financial crisis. You can see the purple line rising through the um, dot-com bus in the 2000s. That's not happening yet or hasn't happened yet. That would be a risk. That's another risk to stock investors because every 1% rise in the forward earnings yield is a 15% decline in the price. One, another thing to note is that the increase in the stock market that we've had this year is very narrow. We should think about the S&P 500 being in two groups, the S&P 7 and then the S&P 493. So the seven um, mega cap uh, uh, technology stocks, you know, um, Meta, Amazon, Apple, you know, that group, in the year through May 22nd, they were up 44%. And then every other stock on average was up just 1%, probably. Um, and, and so if you have the notion, well, stocks are rising, I really should get in. It's, it's important to recognize that a narrow group of stocks is really all the gain in the S&P 500. These stocks have are expensive in terms of valuation ratios relative to the rest of the market. And the rest of, I mean, most of corporate America is really not thriving in this environment. So wow. final slide, I think, and then we yeah. can open it up to questions. So to summarize what Don and I have said, in the last 50 years, selling in May and then buying back in at the end of October, it would have worked. Like stocks had lower returns than bonds in the summer, but there's not a strong reason for this. We're not advising you to do it. And we think the most likely cost and causes are the, the risk-taking at the beginning of the year and the timing of the recessions that we've had these past 50 years. There's strong seasonal patterns in equity factors. And I think that that's interesting and probably worth your attention. Um, and then as we've just related, we think there's a stronger case it, this year uh, to sell in May or sell now because of uh, concerns about the economic outlook and still relatively high valuations of the US stock market. <laughs> Well, Ken, thank you for that. It's, uh, I wish it was happier news, but uh, I'd rather know earlier rather than later. So uh, appreciate the insights. And uh, I'll, we'll turn it over. I see in the chat, there's a few questions. Let me get to the first one here. 
Um, one says summer months have been more associated with recessions. If this is so, is this random or can economic factors explain the outcome? Yeah, I think that it's more a coincidence than being a reliable pattern. Uh, and the reason I believe that is that if I look in the period from in the US history from 1900 to 1970, the recessions tended to happen in the winter. Like the worst time to be in the stock market um, was like in the, the October to May period instead of in the summer. Famously, the great crash of 1929, it began at the end of October, which under this rule you would buy, but that would have been a horrible time to buy because stocks just kept on falling in a considerable amount uh, into that winter. So. Uh, it's interesting that we, in researching for this presentation, we came across an academic article that tested this rule across every country's stock market. And they found that it was a genuinely, like, it would have been a good rule in every country but two around the world. But they tested it in the same periods, uh, the same period from 1970 till now. And, but their conclusion was, well, this is a really reliable signal because, you know, in 98 out of 100 countries, it would have been a good rule. What they didn't observe was that all those 100 countries were operating in the same world economy, and the world economy had recessions in the same months every you know, for, for all of them. And so even though it sounds like it's a stronger conclusion because they said in their article, oh, we tested this, not just you know in the US or Britain, but every country, but it's really not an expansion of the, the certainty one can have by very much because all of these countries are operating in the same global economy. We have another question from Frederick. Is the magnitude of rising rates more important than the starting point, i.e. does the very low beginning point of this cycle make a difference to the analysis? I assume that's equity, equity and uh, equity return analysis. Uh, the well, I think is, I think the question is, is the starting interest rate? Oh, I'm like, sorry. Yeah, is, starting interest yeah, rate right? is like Rising going from Fed funds of almost nothing to five percent. Is that going to have a more negative impact or the same negative impact of going say from five percent to ten percent? So in my view, going from zero to five is a lot more negative than going to five to 10. Think about, let's say that you're a, a small business and you have a floating rate loan. And so you're paying, let's say you're paying, you know, LIBOR plus, I don't know what it is, LIBOR plus five or something like that. If rates go from practically zero to five, then the expansion of your interest expense is a much bigger multiple than if rates go from five to 10. I, I, I do think that you're likely to have a higher degree of distress because of the multiplier effect is bigger if you're starting from a low base in what the interest expense of borrowers uh, is. The two instances where the Fed raised rates you know, a few percent and we didn't have a recession, they were raising rates from, you know, reasonably high, like going like from five to seven, um, in, instead of raising from like zero to five. So, so my my answer um, would be like zero to five is tougher on the economy mm -hmm. than five to 10 would be. Ken, one of the questions I had was uh, it, your, your thoughts on always be invested in the market versus timing, you know, for this particular summer, because and obviously it's, you know, there's a suitability argument here, but to get out and back in the market, I need to be right twice. So I want to sell at the peak and then buy low. And then if I'm taking a tax hit, I, I need to make sure that the, the difference between those is at least equal to the tax or I haven't really gained much. What, what are your thoughts on, on the duration maybe of some of the, if we have a recession and we, and we, we go lower, you know, do you think it's going to be a, a longer or a shorter recession? And, uh, and how are you thinking about equities now in terms of the long-term? Yeah. Um, I think that there's a risk 
well, even if it's a recession, if there's just a stagnant economy or really slow economic growth, that it's likely to be a longer period of, of economic stagnation than we had in the past, in part because there's less in the medicine cabinet, right? There's less monetary stimulus available. The Fed is already stimulated like to an unprecedented degree, and they're trying to go in the opposite direction. There's less fiscal stimulus available. In the COVID period, we had the greatest surge in deficit spending in peacetime in the history of the world. Uh, we had deficits that were sort of parallel World War II level spending. And so having gotten there and now having you know, a mixed political leadership in the U.S. and this pressure on spending, we're not likely to get the kind of fiscal support for the economy uh, in the next downturn that we had in the last three downturns uh, either. And so that could cause the um, any kind of economic slowdown to be harder to counter because the policy response the policy response can't possibly be anything close to what the policy response was three years ago. Like that was like uh, unprecedented and probably there just isn't the resources to repeat that. In terms of if, if one was going to sell in May, in terms of a comment about getting back in, because um, if you're going to get out, you do have to decide when to get back in. It's it, historically the best time to get back in is when things are at their worst. Like when, when the economic data is at its you know its low point, and is starting to turn around, like at the point of maximum pessimism, uh, that's when you have to get in. It's hard to judge. That could be a whole other presentation about how do you know when like you've yeah. gotten to the worst of the worst, and now you should buy. But but really that you really want to buy in the recession, like during the recession, when um, you know. Finally, uh, optimists have thrown in the towel. Uh, then you can do it. Yeah, I don't see any other questions, but I'll I'll give a minute uh, or two. If there are any other questions, please put them in the Q and A box. And uh, I'll just say that you know this uh, this study and this presentation was very eye opening for me. I, I really find um, I find myself perplexed that the market is has been so optimistic, uh, particularly with the five. Obviously, there's a lot of hype around generative AI, and and it is it is going to be you know it is going to make big changes and ripples to the economy, but the things we're seeing uh, in terms of you know large cap tech versus the rest, uh, it does make you wonder uh, who's you know in the battle of the market expectations and the Fed, who's going to win or who's right, I guess, and uh, and I'm I'm. Uh, I'd say perplexed that so many people who are looking at the same data seem to have different uh, opinions here. Mm. So I don't know if you have any comments on that or other times you've seen the market be, you know, wildly off base, but it does get off sides from time to time. And uh, I think you mentioned earlier that after long periods of uh, low interest rates and high returns, people get complacent about risk. And I, I think that might be the best explanation I've heard. Yep. The the main rule for equity bear markets is stocks were expensive and then there was a recession. If you look at like all the bear markets that we've had, uh, not all of them, but like 80 plus percent of them, that was the model. So stocks arguably are relatively expensive. And so if we have a recession, then that's that's the danger. Of course, we don't know, we don't know for sure, but it does seem like the data are indicating uh, some economic weakness here. So thanks all of you who joined us today. Thanks, Don, I enjoyed doing this with you. Yeah, I see we're at time. Thanks, Ken. And uh, uh, oh, one more quick last minute question. Is the money supply an important variable to evaluate? Great question. Um, I, I think it does make a big difference. I, in fact, if you, I've seen graphs of the stock market against the amount of money that the Fed has created. And it does seem that, you know, creating money is good for stocks and taking money away is not good. <laughs> and so I, I yeah. expect there would be some impact of the amount of liquidity in the system on the price of the stock market.
And I'll just say one thing, one anomaly we, we looked at, you touched on it, Ken, uh, in our discussions, but we didn't put it in the slides because it was so volatile, which was the, the, the backlog of treasury issuances due to the debt ceiling and other things, it might also affect liquidity. So there are, there are a lot of moving parts when you when thinks when mm -hmm. thinks about liquidity and money supply that could come into play in the near in the near term here. So mm -hmm. uh, I think we're near time. Thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you, Ken, very mm -hmm. much for all the great work and insights. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at future events. All right. Thanks. All right. Goodbye, Thank everyone. Thank you.